He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. You know I love Easter. This morning, it's a toss-up between Easter and Christmas. I don't think I've ever said that. Um, first of all, I need to thank Nathaniel. I need to thank our journey staff. We've been celebrating Easter all week out here. Um, since last Sunday, we had Journey this week, and, and Adrian and, and Shelly, I, I got to thank them for getting that set up and ready to go. Uh, every person that participated in the setup, we got to share the gospel with 140 people. Oh, praise God. Yes. Yes, they got to hear the story of Christ through just Scripture, right? They, 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 there was no agenda from us. It was just come and read the story of Jesus. When you leave, there's, there's papers across Fellowship Hall up on the wall. Those are the responses of the people that walk through Journey. Take, take a moment and just read how some were impacted by what they read and what they saw. Then this morning, we get up and, and early. We got up early, right? right? There were some of you there. I know. I know. Some of you, some of you <clears throat> didn't make it. <laughs> I'm sad for you. You saw, the, you saw the forecast and you thought it's going to be cloudy. And you know what? There were some clouds, but it just made the sunrise that much more spectacular. That sun came up over the horizon. It was beautiful. We got to celebrate at daybreak the resurrection. Then this meal happened, and I was told it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, it was good. I actually ate. I don't normally eat before a sermon, and I did. So about halfway through, we may have to pause for me to just take a break here, and then we'll come back. Isn't it wonderful to come together celebrating a truth that we believe? That our Savior is not dead. That he defeated death. That he made a way for us to be reconciled to God. It is important for us to keep first things first. And it's, it's never been more important in the life of the church than it is today. This morning, we get to, to, to the one who say, we, 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 we get to celebrate the one who saved us, the one who made this way that we might know God personally. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. The church has been given one mission, and, and that always will be the first activity that we're about, fulfilling the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations. The church is unique in, in many ways when you compare it to other institutes or entities within the world. Not the least of which is because the mission of the church is determined by the message of the church. The church must put above everything else the proclamation of, of the message of the Bible or the church, but it's the first and most important message of both. Essentially, this is what the most prolific writer of the New Testament and perhaps the most famous Christian who ever lived says in this passage this morning that we're going to look at. It's accurate to say that the, the primary reason Jesus came was so the world would have a gospel to embrace, so that we, as the church, would be able to proclaim the gospel. And yet I think they're, 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 we're living in a day when, when more and more churches and, and more and more pastors and teachers are putting less and less emphasis on the gospel. And that's to our detriment. That's why on Easter... That's why on this day when we celebrate his resurrection, it's important we address the gospel, the truth that Christ is risen. For, for us to be encouraged as we celebrate him today and we keep these first things first. So we've got a long passage ahead. I know you looked in your bulletin you're like, two points, man, we're going to be out of here in 15 minutes. We have a long passage. But I think it's important that we spend some time on it this morning. If you would, let's read 1 Corinthians starting in in chapter 15, here's what it says. Now, I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to the one born at the wrong time, he, he also appeared to me. 
for I am the least of the apostles, not, not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have believed. Paul begins this passage with, with a, a somewhat surprising but, but also helpful statement. These words translated make clear seems to be a little bit more difficult than it might appear. See, these Corinthians, they, they knew and they understood the gospel enough to be saved by it. But for some reason to be seen, Paul, Paul obviously felt the need to make crystal clear the true essence of the gospel again. In the early church, there was a need to continuously clarify the heart of the gospel. Simply put, Paul said that the gospel is so important because it's how anyone is saved. How, how can people come to know God through faith in Jesus Christ unless they hear and unless they respond to the gospel? With that being true, Paul's next statement logically follows. Paul, Paul says, the most important message of the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the one message, the, the foremost message that should always make the cut in our preaching and, and in our teaching. In the context of the letter, th this statement carries even more force. See, Paul had to deal with so many different subjects in the church, but he declares that the most important subject is and always will be the gospel. To reiterate it, not, not only the message of the church, but it's the main message of the church. Paul feels the need to, to define exactly, almost to the last letter of the last word, what the gospel is. He, he lets us know there are three key components to the gospel. Paul refers to the fact that he's passing on what he's received. This indicates his, his confession likely dates back to the time when, when Paul was called to be an apostle within about three years after Jesus was crucified. The first truth of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. According to the scripture, Jesus died concerning the sins of the world. And because of the sins of the world, he died as our substitute. What made his death stand out above every other death in history is first that he died because of our sins. The emphasis is, is surely on the fact that, that Christ died. However, he also rose never to die again. There's another part of the gospel we don't pay a lot of attention to, but it's important. We, we don't often note in, in this conversation that he was buried. And to some, to some, they think that maybe that's redundant. Maybe it's unnecessary. But Paul didn't think it a small detail because the point is that only dead men get buried. He was buried because he was dead. The detail of burial is not only necessary, uh, but it's also a fulfillment of the biblical prophecy. It's entirely possible that Paul was anticipating some objections to the resurrection of Jesus too, because if you deny the resurrection, you either had to deny that he died or you have to deny that he was really raised. But what if he didn't raise? What, what if he didn't come back from the dead? What, what if the corpse of Jesus was just hidden away somewhere? What, what if it turned out that Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead and there was no resurrection of the dead? People in the Corinthian church, they were raising this last question at least. And, and Paul points out in his reply that if you question the latter, you question the former. You can't question one without the other. If there's no resurrection and therefore Christ has not been raised from the, the dead, the, the results truly are catastrophic for both the church and the world. Let's go back to, to chapter 15, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. 
Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Wow. Paul lays out the consequences if we have a dead Jesus. If our Savior is still in the tomb, these are the consequences. A, a, a dead Jesus affects not just the messenger, but also the message. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, then, then pastors and preachers and ministers, they're wasting their time preaching the gospel, and people are wasting their time listening to it. When, when Peter's convinced that, that Jesus really had died and was, was not coming back, when, when he was convinced of that, you know what he did? He went back to fishing. He, he went back to, to just fishing for regular fish. He couldn't fish for men anymore because he had no more bait. He could only fish for fish. Without a risen Savior, there is no sermon, regardless of how beautiful or how logical or, or how stimulating it might be, that's really worth hearing. Paul calls the, the messages, uh, he says these messages that leave out the resurrection they're in vain, which literally means empty. If we're not preaching, if we don't believe that this happened, it's, it's all in vain. If it, if it didn't occur, it's pointless. If Jesus is not dead, not even the great apostle Paul had anything worth saying to anyone about this life or the next. There's nothing worth hearing. The, the facts concerning the resurrection are, are, are not just an issue for pastors, though. They're crucial for every believer. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then those, who are witness, those of us who are witnesses of the gospel, who are sharing and proclaiming the gospels, we're liars. We're guilty of spiritual perjury. Paul essentially says here that if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, that he would be a liar since he claimed repeatedly that he would be raised from the dead. If Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, once again, Christianity just collapses. If there's no resurrection for anyone, then, then Christ has not been raised. You, can, you can't have your feet in both worlds. If you believe in the particular resurrection of Jesus coming, you must believe in the general resurrection of believers. Jesus, still in the tomb, strikes a death blow to the very concept of Christian faith. We live in a world today where most people say, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere in your belief. This statement is nonsensical reasoning it reveals that if, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our faith is foolishness since, since faith's value can be no greater than its object. All the faith in the world would not allow you to, to sit safely in a two-legged chair. All the faith you muster up cannot fly a plane with no fuel. You can't drive a car without re wheels just because you have faith. Along with that, though, there is no salvation if there's no risen Jesus to believe in. Without his completed work, there would be no grace to receive. Because that is true, then Paul's conclusion here is logical. Those assuming that there's no resurrection are still in their sins. To them, sin is sovereign. Sin wins. Salvation is just an illusion. If Jesus is still physically dead, we are still spiritually dead. Sin, sin is still a chain that binds us, a, a load that burdens us, a hammer that breaks us. A dead Jesus offers no hope for those who are living, but would give us, would, but, but he, would he give us any hope for those believers who have died before us? No, because that would imply they would have also perished. Death would still have its sting, the, the grave still its victory. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, there's no hope now. There's no positive afterlife. Our loved ones may as well have been lost. Not only does the dead Jesus kill any hope for life beyond this life, but it kills any hope for the meaning in this life. It might be argued that the Christian life is worth living on its own merit. And, and obviously, I think the world would be a better place if everyone lived as Christians are supposed to live, the way God teaches. But any advantage is short-lived, temporal, and in some sense is futile. If, if Christ was not crucified and is not risen for, for their sins, believers have wasted their lives believing fables. All the hypotheticals give us a very bleak outlook on the world. No hope at all. 
if Jesus did not raise from the dead, but he did, (laughs) but he did. I mean, Paul goes through all of this and you hear how bleak the world would be if it hadn't happened. Thankfully, in these following verses, Paul quickly pivots from the gloom and doom of a purely hypothetical situation to the joyful actuality that Christ has indeed raised from the dead. It gets to the good part. He takes him to the dark. He takes him down where it's hard. Remember when we left last week how dark it was in here? Not anymore. Things have changed. Jesus has raised from the dead. His resurrection is a guarantee of our resurrection. As we see, the the, the past resurrection of Jesus guarantees several facets of, of future resurrection to come. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians and start in verse 20. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end where he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptized for them? Why are we in danger every hour? I face death every day as surely as I may boast about you, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning, for some people are ignorant about God. I say this to your shame. Paul keeps going. He gets to this next section, and these first four words in the verse four set the stage for what Paul's going to address. He says, but as it is, this is Paul's way of emphasizing he is about to introduce some extremely important uh, affirmations that are absolutely true. He goes on to say that since there is an implication that, that none of these Corinthian believers deny the resurrection of Jesus, they have, to, they have to accept the corollary truth, which is that resurrection guarantees their resurrection. Christ's resurrection guarantees that the dead in Christ will be raised. What a great word of comfort to, to the believers then and to us now. All having seen loved ones preceding us in death. We've seen it. We've watched it. It's hard. It's difficult. How many of us, when we watch a family, are like, well, I don't know how they do it if they don't know God. We've got this hope of what's to come. Jesus is the first fruits of those who have died. Jesus' resurrection did not just confirm his identity. It also confirms our identification with him. Jesus is not only the first fruits, but he's surely the last Adam. The the first Adam brought death. The last Adam brought life. The the, the first Adam brought sin. The last Adam brought salvation. The, The first Adam caused separation between humanity and God. And the last Adam brought reconciliation between humanity and God. This is only a good thing for those who are in Christ For these are the only ones who will be resurrected to life eternal. Paul goes on and he moves to this this military metaphor. And there's this, this certain priority in the future resurrection. Earlier, Paul spoke about everything being done in the services of the church decently and in order. The way of doing things is exactly what you would find in the military. Such will prevail at the resurrection. There's an interval between the resurrection of Jesus and and the resurrection of believers in part because the resurrection of believers takes place at the second coming of Christ. The resurrected Lord will descend. And at that time, those who belong to Christ will be raised. They'll be given their new resurrected bodies. 
The return of the resurrected Lord actually sets off this this chain reaction of events that brings life as we know it to a close. And, And Paul gets right to the point with four more words. He says, then comes the end. Now, scholars will debate this. Scholars like to debate a lot of things. But we can't overthink this. Simply understood, it refers to the end of this age. The world that we're living in now, this this world order that we're in, followed by the age to come. And this is when Jesus hands the kingdom over to God the Father. He abolishes all of the rule and all the authority and all the power. And we've got to understand this comprehensively and and rejoice that that any kind of structural opposition to God, whether it's social or political or, or economic or ethical or spiritual, it's all placed under the feet and the authority of Jesus. And Paul declares that Jesus must reign from heaven until this occurs. And then the last enemy, death, will be destroyed. Everything and everyone in every place is brought to this grand conclusion. And just just as God had promised over and over, and as Jesus predicted, everything is put under him, except, of course, the one who put everything under him, God the Father. This is not readily apparent to us today, but as Christ returns, no one will be safe to question it. Then the final climax of this, this passage comes in verse 28. Without question, this verse carries, it, it carries some, some inherent difficulties. And it, it's safe to say nothing in these verses should be construed as even implying that, that Jesus is inferior to the Father. Any thought of eternal submission of the Son should be rejected. It's it's rather a functional subordination. The kingdom of Christ comes to an end in its present phase, but only to merge into the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. So there's no failure of the prophetic promise that the Messiah's kingdom will know no end. Paul now brings the Corinthians back to the matter of daily life. And, and shows them how the reality of their coming resurrection should impact the way they live. We don't live like the rest of the world. We shouldn't live like the rest of the world. Paul leaves the realm of the theological and he enters the realm of the experiential. And he begins with an allusion to a very strange practice, this, this baptism for the dead. Whatever it was, he doesn't go into detail. He doesn't explain it. There's a lot of theories out there. But whatever it is, the point should not be missed. The practice makes absolutely no sense if the resurrection wasn't true. Paul doesn't doesn't make it either positive or negative about this practice, but unfortunately, he doesn't explain it. And kind of looking into it a little more, I I think it has to do with with this this baptism for the dead referring to this practice meant to, to honor believers who had shared the gospel with a friend or a relative even as their own deaths neared. Then after their deaths, in cases where where the friend or relative came to faith in Christ, he or she could request to receive baptism on behalf of the dead person. Regardless, if if there's no resurrection, then to face this, to do this, to face persecution, to face enemies of the faith or even martyrdom is senseless. Suffering, in fact, is senseless if this life is all there is. The logical alternative would be to embrace this life, to party it up, to grab every pleasure you can. And there were obviously people espousing this in Corinth. And that gives credence to Paul's statement, do not be deceived. He says, bad company corrupts good morals. And I'd I'd go a little further and say anyone who denies not only the resurrection in general, but the resurrection of Christ specifically, or, or argues against the trustworthiness of the word of God is bad company. Paul's conclusion of the matter is pointedly made in verse 34. And this expresses the theological heart of the chapter and the the linchpin of Paul's entire argument. To deny the resurrection shows a breathtaking ignorance of God in both his power and his purpose. To deny the, the truth of the resurrection is not just ignorance, but wickedness. There's no excuse for being seduced into following heresy when the truth of the word of God is before us. Jesus was right. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There is no greater truth than the truth that because Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be too. 
Whether or not Jesus raised from the dead has tremendous implications on our eternal future. Just as Paul has shown the foolishness of of believing in a still dead Jesus, he shows the tremendous benefits of believing in a risen one. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits that guarantees our resurrection as well. We get the privilege of walking in Jesus' steps in his resurrection, and, and we get the privilege of being with the Father when our time on earth is done. What a hope we have in him. What a glorious truth. What a reason to celebrate our Jesus. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Do you believe it? Say it like you believe it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, this is good stuff. This is why we celebrate. This is why we come together to worship our Savior. We're going to respond through song this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand. And we're going to say it one more time because I think when we stand, we can speak louder. I'm almost positive. So before we sing, before I pray, let's say it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You almost got it. <laughs> Band, come on up. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer before we respond through song this morning. Father, we just thank you so much for the gift of your son. God, the fact that you had this plan for us to be reconciled to you. This costly plan that, that took the life of your son. And we're so grateful that he willingly did it, that he walked through the pain and the torture, that he lays his life down, that he dies, and that he's buried. That it wasn't the end of the story, God, and we thank you that we see him raised from the dead because he's so powerful because he can defeat death and in doing so creates this way for us to know you personally, to have salvation so that we don't ever have to be separated from you. Praise you for that, God. Father, as we take this time to respond through song, I pray that you would just open our hearts today. Help us to see with fresh eyes what this resurrection means. Only you can do that, God. So we give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. We ask that you're blessed and glorified through our response today as we lift our voices to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.